For thousands of years, people knew only about the planets Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, which they could see using simple telescopes, or even by the naked eye, if conditions were good. But in the late 18th century, a famous astronomer named Sir William Herschel discovered a new planet that was icy blue in color. At first, people thought it was a star, but later they realized it was a planet. Today, we know it as Uranus, a planet that's more than 19 times farther away from the Sun than Earth. It's so far away that it takes Uranus 84 years to complete one trip around the Sun. This astronomer also discovered many other interesting things in space, like double stars and nebulae. In the mid-1800s, scientists noticed something pulled Uranus and strangely tugged its orbit. They thought there must be another planet out there, and they used math to predict where it would be. Finally, in 1846, they found Neptune using a telescope. It was too faint to see with the naked eye because it was too far away from the sun. It was all so exciting. Who knows how many other planets could be there lurking in the darkness of our solar system. Back in the mid 1800s, Astronomers noticed something unusual was happening in the sky. A small, rocky planet named Mercury was behaving strangely. It didn't follow the predictable orbit that was expected of it. One of the astronomers was a brilliant French scientist named Urbain Le Verrier. He came up with a theory that there could be another planet in our solar system no one had yet discovered. It would be located somewhere between Mercury and the Sun. This hypothetical planet, which he named Vulcan after the Roman god of fire, would have an incredibly hot surface. And it could be a potential explanation for Mercury's strange behavior. He never surely claimed Vulcan was really the one thing disturbing the orbit of Mercury. But excited by the possibility of discovering a new planet, astronomers all over the world took the idea of Vulcan. For a planet that didn't exist, People committed to developing ideas and getting information about it. Some scientists didn't think it was likely that they had missed another planet as big as Mercury. It would have been hard not to see it by then. But there was a tiny chance of a smaller planet existing inside Mercury's orbit that was too close to the Sun so no one could see it. One theory said it was about 13 million miles away from the Sun. Mercury is the planet with the most eccentric orbit in our solar system, but the closest point it gets to the Sun is about 28.5 million miles. This means Vulcan would be under half of that distance. The theory moved on, saying that if Vulcan existed, it would orbit the Sun every 19 days and 18 hours, and its path would be tilted about 12 degrees relative to the path of other planets in our solar system. Vulcan's position at its furthest point from the Sun would still be too close to the Sun to be seen with the naked eye, even during twilight. The only chance of seeing Vulcan would be during a solar eclipse, or when it passed in front of the Sun, which, as the theory said, would be two to four times a year. They had a theory that this mysterious planet was so close to the Sun that it could only be seen during a total solar eclipse when the Moon blocked out the Sun's blinding glare. So, every time there was an eclipse, scientists would peer at the Sun, hoping to catch a glimpse of Vulcan. They were trying really hard, but no matter what, they couldn't find this mysterious planet. Some astronomers claimed to have spotted it during eclipses, but no one could ever confirm or find evidence for that. The theory of Vulcan was left waiting for some better times. Einstein had a different idea. You know about his theory of general relativity, right? That's where he claimed gravity wasn't some sort of natural force, but a result of space-time curved because of the presence of giant space objects, like planets and stars. Planets circle around the sun in their usual orbit because space-time is curved. That means the planets are kind of falling towards the central star of our solar system. And Einstein tried to explain Mercury's unusual orbit using his own theory of relativity. Unlike the other planets in our solar system, Mercury's orbit wasn't that circular. Instead, it seemed to wobble slightly, as if there was an invisible force pulling it away. 
Einstein said this could be happening because the massive gravity of our sun was actually curving the fabric of space-time around it. He claimed it's possible this changed Mercury's orbit a little bit. It took the scientific community a while to test this theory, but it eventually seemed like the most plausible explanation. Even though Einstein's theory gave us a more elegant explanation for Mercury's strange orbit, some scientists were still holding out hope for Vulcan. It was especially hard to let go of the idea of Vulcan because Mercury is also the planet that's really hard to see from where we're standing. But later, more and more scientists started accepting Einstein's theory above their imagination. And they would observe a total solar eclipse specifically to test Einstein's theory of relativity, not because of Vulcan. And Vulcan is not the only hypothetical planet everyone was talking about. In the newer age, some believe there could be a mysterious planet lurking in the outer part of our solar system. But this one is more likely to exist. No one has seen it directly yet, but computer simulations show this so-called Planet 9, or Planet X, is probably somewhere there beyond Neptune. Neptune and Planet X could be similar in size. Planet X could be 10 times more massive than Earth and circles around our Sun in an elongated shape which is, on average, 20 times farther from the Sun than Neptune. A year there may last between 10,000 to 20,000 Earth years. By comparison, a year on Neptune lasts 165 Earth years. Something this big moving out there beyond Neptune could explain the unusual orbits of smaller objects in the Kuiper Belt. The Kuiper Belt is the area of our solar system beyond Neptune and where it orbits. And there are most likely many asteroids, comets, and some other smaller bodies there, mostly made of ice. There was another hypothetical planet called Nibiru. Remember those rumors that the world could end back in 2012? One of the popular scenarios was Nibiru, which some claimed would hit our home planet at the end of the year. Of course, nothing happened. We're still here, all set and good, but the idea of Nibiru seemed interesting. Stories started in the 1970s when a man named Zachariah Sitchin mentioned Nibiru in his book, The Twelfth Planet, claiming it orbits the Sun every 3,600 years. But there's no chance a planet with such an eccentric orbit wouldn't disrupt other planets in our solar system with its gravity. And if it was really coming that close to Earth in 2012, we were supposed to be able to see it with the naked eye. Some simple calculations showed Nibiru would have been nearly as bright as Mars at its dimmest and brighter than the faintest stars you see from a city. Oh well, maybe we'll have more luck in the next 3,500 and something years. In 2011, a comet named Elenin appeared that many people thought could be Nibiru. But when you're looking at comets and planets through a telescope, you see they appear differently. A comet has a coma which is a gas atmosphere, together with a tail, something a planet doesn't have. Plus, this comet didn't slam into the Earth. It came too close to our Sun and fell apart. The leftover pieces will continue moving on their way to the outer solar system for the next 12,000 years. You take off from Earth and park your spacecraft somewhere near the Moon. You're now almost 240,000 miles away from your home planet. That's almost 100 widths of the United States. Now you take out a giant hammer and an enormous chisel using the robotic arms of your spaceship. You place the chisel at the Earth's North Pole and strike its head with the hammer. Earth splits open like an eggshell, and you see it, another planet. It's Thea, and it's hiding inside our planet like a yolk in an egg. You'd need to go back in time 4.5 billion years to find out how it got there. This beautiful nebula will soon become our solar system. Colored dust and various space debris are slowly coming closer toward the common center. Soon this jigsaw puzzle of debris becomes too heavy and dense. The temperature inside the giant is rising. Soon it gets so high that it triggers a nuclear chain reaction. Another second and... BAM! There's an explosion so powerful that the shockwaves travel far into dark space. 
and the blinding flash from this blast can be seen from the other side of the Milky Way galaxy. When the dust clears a little, you can see that a bright light is still shining at the very center of the explosion. This newborn star is the Sun. It weighs as much as 333,000 Earths. If the Sun was a bucket, you'd need 1.3 million Earth-sized planets to fill it. You're interested in a small object over there, 93 million miles away from the Sun. This pile of rocks and hot lava is Earth. Right now, the planet is busy forming its core, while the oceans of lava are gradually cooling down. But a few tens of million years after the Sun's birth, you notice a strange object hurtling toward Earth. It's Thea. This small planet was born at about the same time as Earth, and now it's following a crazy spiral trajectory at enormous speed. Scientists believe Thea was kind of a ball Jupiter and Venus played with. Venus was pulling Thea in one direction, then Big Brother Jupiter pulled it back. But the Sun makes up 99.8% of the mass of the entire solar system. That's why the star sets its own rules. It makes Thea move in almost the same orbit as Earth. So they inevitably come closer and closer to each other until they become next-door neighbors. We see that Thea is the size of Mars and as wide as the Atlantic Ocean from New York to Portugal. A collision can't be avoided. Thea is traveling toward Earth at nearly 9,000 miles per hour. That's 11 times faster than the speed of sound. If the smaller planet crashes into Earth at a particular angle, Earth will most likely be torn apart, as well as Thea itself. The collision will cause a huge blast, visible on other planets even on a bright day. Nothing will be left but some burning dust and debris. Even if Thea touches Earth only lightly, it'll still knock out a chunk of our planet the size of Australia. But the collision with Thea happens at a perfect 45-degree angle. It strikes the Earth at tremendous speed. The explosion literally vaporizes huge amounts of rock, and the shock wave sends the remaining debris into Earth's orbit. A huge crater is formed at the impact site. Soon, it gets filled with boiling lava. The remnants of Thea and the ejected fragments of Earth begin to orbit our planet. According to one version, these fragments form two moons. At first, they travel together, but one day, they get too close to each other and collide, forming one large space body. The other theory claims that all the shards start being pulled by the remnants of Thea. Sometime later, they form the moon as we now know it. At that point in the past, though, it's just red-hot rock and lava. The collision at this angle slightly tilts our planet and accelerates its rotation. It's because of Thea that we have different seasons and 24 hours in a day. Earth has lithospheric plates. These are enormous solid pieces that make up the crust of our planet. After the collision with Thea, they start to break and crack. It causes carbon, a primary component of all known life on Earth, to start moving all over our planet. So, Earth gets some kind of metabolism. After a few hundred million years, the first living creatures start to appear on our planet. Over nearly four billion years, simple single-celled organisms have been evolving into the life you see today. According to scientists, such a collision is a very rare event. The probability that somewhere out there, there's a planet like ours that has survived the same catastrophe is extremely small. This may be the reason why we are yet to find traces of other civilizations out there in space. Meanwhile, the remains of Thea are still here on Earth. Of course, it doesn't look like an entire planet stuck inside our own. Most of the fragments have melted and blended into the Earth's crust. If you take the top layer off our planet, you'll see two huge lava blobs the size of entire continents. They're right below Africa and the Pacific Ocean. Presumably, these are the remains of Thea. They didn't mix with Earth's mantle because of different densities. It's like mixing water and oil in a glass. The oil will always float up over the water and create an even layer on top of it. But if you raise those lava patches up to the surface, they'd be 100 times higher than Mount Everest. Other remains of Thea might be on the moon. The Apollo space missions brought back many soil samples for analysis. Scientists have concluded that the moon is very similar to Earth in structure. People could drill deep down and take samples there. Then they'd analyze the blobs from Earth. 
if their structure matched, it'd be 100% proof that Thea did hit Earth 4.5 billion years ago. And that's how we got the moon. But for the time being, Thea remains somewhat mysterious. Scientists are still not sure that the planet actually existed. The whole idea perfectly fits the model of the moon's creation. But in fact, this incredible collision may have never happened. Hop on the bright side of life together with our brand new tees, hoodies, and more. Click the link to pick your choice. Now you travel 41 light years away from Earth to the planet 55 Cancri E. It's about twice the size of Earth and eight times heavier. You take out your giant hammer again and use it to hit the chisel. The planet cracks, and you see it's a giant diamond. The temperature on this planet is tens of times higher than that of Earth, and its soil is rich in carbon. The heat puts a lot of pressure on this carbon. Its structure changes. First, it turns into graphite. Some more pressure, and graphite turns into diamond. On Earth, diamonds form at depths below 60 miles, where the pressure is 50,000 times greater than on the surface. The temperatures there rise over 1,000 degrees, which is as hot as fire. Diamonds are ejected closer to the surface in volcanic eruptions. Still, people have to dig mines 1,500 feet deep to find these beautiful gems. The Golden Jubilee Diamond is the biggest cut and faceted diamond on Earth. It weighs as much as a chocolate bar and is the size of a hamster. Its price is about $12 million. Now imagine a diamond the size of an entire planet. You decide to fly back to the solar system. Your destination is Jupiter's moon, Europa. It's as wide as the distance between Seattle and Houston, and its mass is less than 1% the mass of Earth. Its surface is enclosed in an icy crust. It's about 19 miles thick. But what if you crack this crust with your giant hammer? Wow, Europa is completely covered in water. It's freezing here, three times colder than at the North Pole on Earth. The water turns into ice almost instantly, but the ocean beneath the surface is still liquid. Europa interacts with Jupiter gravitationally, just like the moon with Earth. This creates tidal forces and heats Europa's core. The core melts the ice around it. The result is a huge ocean, two to three times larger than all of Earth's oceans combined. Scientists believe that water is the basis of life. It may mean that life may exist on Europa. There could be thermal springs, just like at the bottom of our oceans. The water there is probably much warmer. And even though the pressure and temperature in such places are likely to be extreme, simple bacteria may live there. Europa is almost the same age as Earth. This means there has been enough time for living organisms to appear and evolve. Who knows, maybe some advanced civilization is already blooming under this crust of ice. They may be building big cities and dreaming of conquering space right now. But the only thing people can do at the moment is send a probe to Europa and find out if life is possible there. As scientists continue to explore the vast expanse of the universe, they've made some incredible discoveries that have left them with more questions than answers. From a scorching super-Earth to a football-shaped world, the exoplanet discoveries of 2022 are truly out of this world. So hold on tight, the future of exoplanet discoveries is looking brighter than ever. Number 1. New type of exoplanets Red dwarfs make up over 70% of all stars in space. So, in September of 2022, scientists decided to take a closer look at the small worlds orbiting them. What they found was amazing. New type of exoplanets that were made of half rock and half water, either in liquid or ice form. The researchers suggested that these planets likely arose from icy material and were born far away from their stars, past the ice line, where surface temperatures are freezing. But they later migrated closer in, to where the astronomers detected them. This discovery could have huge implications in the search for life in the cosmos. Though these planets are loaded with water, they might not be covered in oceans. Who knows? Maybe one of them will be the next Earth 2.0. Number 2. Jupiter-Size World Imagine a planet so massive and mysterious, it's like a hidden Jupiter in our galaxy. Well, we just discovered one of those orbiting a star just 379 light-years away. Just. <laughs> We've named it the TOI 2180b, and it's got everyone talking. Why? 
Well, for starters, this planet takes a whopping 261 days to orbit its star, which is much longer than most distant gas giants we've come across so far. But that's not all. The temperature on this world is surprisingly mild, averaging at a balmy 170 degrees Fahrenheit. For comparison, the temperature on Jupiter and Saturn is around minus 280 degrees. It's like a bridge between the giant exoplanets we've found and our Jupiter. But the question remains, how did this planet get to be so different? Scientists are still trying to figure that out. Let's hope that we get some answers soon. Number 3. The Hulk Planet This world is a place where the surface is covered in molten magma, and the year lasts just half a day. Welcome to TOI 1075b, an exoplanet that's been dubbed the Planet Hulk by scientists. Located 200 light-years away, this super-Earth is one of the most massive ever discovered. Its proximity to its parent star causes its surface to reach scorching temperatures of 1922 degrees. It's so hot that any form of water would evaporate instantly, and the air would be filled with vaporized rock. But it's not just the heat that's impressive, it's also its size. TOI 1075b is nearly 10 times the mass of Earth, making it one of the most massive super-Earths ever discovered. But the mystery doesn't stop there. The planet's orbit takes just 14 and a half hours, making it one of the shortest orbital periods ever recorded for a planet of its size. What an exciting addition to our catalog! Number 4. Three Doomed Planets Astronomers made a shocking discovery of three planets that are circling in a dangerous dance next to the slowly fading stars. Just a decade ago, scientists never even imagined such planets could exist. These gas giant planets, similar in size to Jupiter, orbit way too close to their slowly fading stars. They're basically walking on the edge. Take one of them, for example, dubbed TOI 2337b. Its orbit will likely send it hurtling straight into the fiery arms of its host star in less than a million years. Well, I won't be around then. As these stars enter their final days, they're pulling in nearby planets like a black hole, altering their orbits and potentially causing catastrophic collisions. And as these planets get closer to their stars, their atmospheres heat up and swell leading to some mind-boggling differences in density. But despite the doom and gloom, studying these worlds could give us valuable insights into the evolution of our own solar system. Number 5. Planet with a barium's atmosphere These are two hot blazing planets, each with an atmosphere made of the heaviest element ever found in an exoplanet, barium. These planets, known as WASP-76b and WASP-121b, are ultra-hot gas giants called super-Jupiters that orbit incredibly close to their stars. These planets are basically like giant balls of fire, with one side facing the star, cooking at temperatures hot enough to vaporize iron and other metals. But as the hot iron vapor is blown into the planet's cooler night side, it turns into liquid and falls as iron rain. And these planets held a special surprise for us. Barium is a heavy metal, about two and a half times as heavy as iron. And yet, scientists were able to detect it in the upper layers of these planets' atmospheres. This is truly a mystery, and a puzzle we're still trying to solve. Imagine landing on a planet like this and looking at this rain of iron and the heavy barium in its skies. That would be awesomely horrifying. Number 6. The Football Planet Get ready to have your mind blown, space enthusiasts, because we've just discovered the ultimate football-shaped planet, and it's unlike anything we've ever seen before. Meet WASP-103b, the ultra-hot exoplanet that's more than a thousand light-years away from Earth. This gas giant is so close to its parent star that its shape is being stretched by the intense gravitational forces. But this isn't just a fun shapeshifter. It's also a valuable scientific discovery. By studying the planet's passes across its star, we were able to measure its deformation for the first time ever. It's like taking a snapshot of a planet in motion, and it's giving us insights into the extreme conditions that these planets can endure. This is truly a great discovery. Number 7. A Zodiacal Light Are you ready for a cosmic ghost story? 
scientists and high school students in China have uncovered a spooky phenomenon on three distant exoplanets. It's called zodiacal light, a glow that's similar to the one seen here on Earth during sunset. But this isn't just some eerie light show. It could hold clues about the makeup of these potentially habitable worlds. Imagine watching the sunset from a dark spot on Earth, and instead of darkness, a triangle of light appears. That's zodiacal light. It's caused by sunlight reflecting off dust particles that fill the solar system, the remains of asteroids and comets. A team of researchers analyzed 47 potential habitable exoplanets named Kepler-69c, Kepler-1229b, and Kepler-395c, all super-Earths, had signs of this light. This discovery is more than just a spooky phenomenon. It could reveal information about the presence of asteroids and comets in these exoplanet systems, which could be difficult to detect otherwise. So that's pretty neat. Number 8. A planet with silicate clouds Introducing VHS 1259b, not a home video recording system, but a strange and exotic world shrouded in mystery and wonder. A place where the clouds are made of sand and the sky is forever red. This isn't the stuff of science fiction, but a real-life discovery made by the brilliant minds at NASA. This is a brown dwarf exoplanet that's making waves in the astronomical community. It's way too massive for a planet, nearly 20 times the size of Jupiter, but it's not quite a star. It's something in between, a cosmic enigma that defies definition. But what's really crazy about VHS 1256b is its atmosphere. Scientists have discovered that this strange world is cloaked in thick clouds of silicate grains, similar to sand. It's the first time this kind of cloud has ever been detected on an exoplanet. And it's a discovery that's sure to change the way we think about the universe and the possibilities of life beyond our world. And there you have it, folks. The year 2022 was filled with incredible discoveries and groundbreaking findings in the world of exoplanets. But this is just the beginning, as scientists and researchers continue to explore the vast expanse of space. We can only imagine what other wonders await us. So let's keep looking. Who knows what secrets the stars hold for us next? While we may think of ourselves as advanced after catching a glimpse of the eight planets of our solar system and their 200 moons, we really have little idea of what's out there. So much so that there's speculation that there might be one more planet in our solar system. Scientists call it Planet X or Planet 9. This undiscovered world could be hidden way out past Neptune. Asteroids and dwarf planets in this area have weirdly unexplained altered orbits, and Planet X may be the reason. Tales of this mysterious planet began over a hundred years ago with a man called Percival Lowell. Lowell had a great love of space, and aside from having an impressive mustache, he was also super rich. Ooh, that lucky guy. He used his riches to build an observatory in Arizona. He then dedicated it to study the odd motions of Uranus and Neptune. Their gravitational pulls are slower than those of all the other planets in our solar system, almost as if there is a giant hidden object pulling them off course. In 1906, Lowell theorized that there could be another planet out beyond Neptune. It probably caused those strange cosmic happenings. The man called this potential space body Planet X. In 1930, Pluto was discovered by Clyde Tombaugh at Lowell's very own observatory. It finally looked like people had an explanation for the weird orbital patterns. Lowell's team was on cloud 9 after the discovery, but their celebrations were short-lived. Soon, they found out that Pluto is way too small to be having that much of an effect on the surrounding planets. And it was also too far away from them. So it was back to the drawing board. Planet X, if it exists, is 10 times the size of Earth and 4 times its radius. It would take at least 10,000 years for the planet to orbit the Sun. And it would sit over 200 times further out than our home planet. That's 600 astronomical units from the center of the solar system. FYI, an astronomical unit equals the distance between the Earth and the Sun. But while that sounds super far away, it's actually not. 
The distance between space bodies is usually measured in light years, and an astronomical unit is a much smaller unit of measurement. For context, the most distant thing detected from Earth is the galaxy GNZ11. Cute name, huh? It sits a staggering 32 billion light years away. Even so, our telescopes can still spot it. And just one light year is the same as 63,241 astronomical units. Woo! So, if our tech can detect a galaxy that's so far away, how have we not been able to uncover Planet X? Well, it's probably down to the fact that it might not even exist. The theory of Planet X was pretty much debunked back in 1989. It was discovered that the mysterious gravitational pulls of Neptune had been a red herring all along. Scientists had massively misjudged just how big Neptune actually was. Voyager 2 visited the planet and discovered its actual size. This new info explained the odd gravitational pulls, meaning they weren't being caused by the so-called Planet X. But that's not where our investigation ends, as the hypothetical ninth planet once again popped up around 10 years ago. While the evidence behind Lowell's theory was wrong, his belief in Planet X may not have been. In 2015, astronomers Michael Brown and Konstantin Batigin discovered that there were, in fact, unexplained gravitational forces at play past Neptune. There are satellites that orbit planets perpendicularly, which doesn't happen anywhere else in our solar system. There's also clusters of asteroids that move in very specific ways, so specific that it's basically impossible that it could be random. Even weirder, there are satellites that travel in completely opposite direction to the Sun, unlike most other things in the solar system. A planetoid called Sedna also appears to be being pulled towards something, along with six others, all going in the same direction. And Brown and Batigen aren't just any other stargazers. They're both well-respected scientists at the top of their game. Konstantin Batigen has been named in Forbes as one of 30 scientists who are changing the world. And Mike Brown was the man who rebranded Pluto as a dwarf planet. This means that when these guys say something, it's usually pretty legit, and you should probably listen. But the only way we can really prove Planet X exists is to actually find it, and this has turned out to be pretty difficult. To locate the planet, we'd need to use a method called transit photometry. This is basically where we monitor a whole bunch of stars for a long time and look out for any dips in the light they give off. These dips would likely be caused by a planet getting in the way. And ta-da! The existence of Planet X could be proved. But for this method to work, Earth, the new planet, and the Sun all have to be perfectly aligned. These circumstances are pretty rare. And if these conditions don't exist, the dip in light won't happen. Plus, this method would only really work with planets that are closer to the Sun than our Earth. That's Venus and Mercury. For anything past Earth, this technique is pretty much useless. Another technique we could use is to find the potential planet through a good old-fashioned telescope. But as you can imagine, that's insanely tricky. The furthest object that we've found in our solar system is a planetoid, appropriately named, far, far out. But that's only 140 AU away from the Sun. That's only like a quarter of the way to Planet X. We can only see an object because of its brightness. The Sun is very visible to us because it emits huge amounts of light. And we can see the Moon because it reflects the Sun's light. Technically, the Moon has no right to appear brighter than everything else in the night sky. It only seems brighter because we're closer to it. The farther away an object is, the less bright it appears to us. The major issue with seeing the theoretical Planet X is that all objects in our solar system get their light from the Sun. They reflect sunlight, and that's why we can see them. Given how far away from the Sun Planet X might be, it makes it nearly impossible to see. And because of its really dim light, to view it, we would require perfect weather conditions as well as an extremely strong telescope. But Brown and Batigen have found the perfect one. The Subaru Telescope is located at the top of a dormant volcano in Hawaii. It's huge and is capable of capturing even the weakest light from distant space objects. 
The issue that we need to figure out is where to point it. Without knowing where Planet X actually is, this basically turns things into a giant guessing game. There are also only around three nights every year when the conditions are clear enough to see the hypothetical Planet X. It's difficult, but not impossible. And still, most astronomers have called it a day and agreed that Planet X doesn't exist, stating that it's just a common myth. The most widespread explanation for the weird gravitational pulls is that there's a tiny black hole in our solar system. It's pulling the planets toward us. But don't worry. They say it's not big enough to actually munch on a planet. So Earth is all good, for now. The issue with the black hole theory is that, once again, it's almost impossible for us to track the thing down. While its mass could be as great as that of Planet X, the hole itself would be squished down to the size of an orange. Telescopes wouldn't be of any use. To find it, people would have to look for the gamma rays sent off by objects as they fall into the black hole. Another way we could find it is to release hundreds of tiny spacecraft. They would pass close enough to the hypothetical hole, and when they got pulled toward it, we could probably detect it. But don't count out Brown and Batigen's theory. It's still being documented by NASA. And until we find unmistakable evidence to prove any theories, Planet X might still be out there. We've discovered Kepler 22b, a small exoplanet in the Cygnus constellation. Seems like nothing important, right? But it's actually a big deal. This is the first planet located in the habitable zone that was found by the Kepler telescope. In other words, there may be water on this planet, and if there's water, there may be life. Kepler 22b can become our new potential home. So let's take a closer look at it. Actually, discovering new planets is not easy at all. Not all of them can be seen through our super cool telescopes, even the almighty Hubble. Sometimes the stars are so small and dim that it's really hard to find them on a map. The same thing happened with Kepler 22. In such cases, scientists have to use a special method. First, they take a bunch of photos of the star in different periods of time. Then, they look at them and think, hmm, are there any dark dots on this star somewhere? And if they find one, that might be a planet. These photos actually help us to discover some very important stuff. Like, first of all, this planet exists. Secondly, here is its size, radius, and proximity to the star. And finally, will we be able to live there? Now we know that Kepler 22b is very similar to our planet and could potentially become a second Earth. It's also very close to us, only 635 light years away. Yeah, it's about three quadrillion miles, but this is one of the closest options. Kepler 22, the star of Kepler 22b, is a yellow dwarf. It's very, very similar to our sun. The same size, the same radius, even the age is almost the same. 4 billion years. The difference is only in luminosity. It's about 20% dimmer than the sun. So, no matter how much you strain your eyes, you won't see this star in the night sky. The planet Kepler 22b is about 2.4 times larger than our Earth. And that's pretty good. More radius means more potential water and space to live. Although going from one city to another would take a while. It's scary to even imagine a three-day long plane flight. We don't know the exact mass of this planet, but scientists think it's bigger than Earth's. Actually, the mass of Kepler 22b can be up to 36 times greater than that of our planet. What does it mean? Vigorous gravity. If the planet is 36 times heavier than Earth, then gravity there will be about six times stronger. Can you barely lift 20 pounds of potatoes? Try 120. Not to mention that you yourself can become much heavier on that planet. You'll have to get incredibly pumped up just to walk there. You have to literally turn yourself into a bodybuilder just to get to work. The worst thing is that with such gravity, it'd be incredibly difficult for plants to survive there. They'd need at least a little freedom to rise up from the ground. 
and animals. Our dogs and cats would have to turn into little balls of muscle to survive there. But if this planet has its own animals or other inhabitants, we can roughly imagine what they may look like. They probably have a lot of legs to make moving easier. They aren't really tall, but they're very massive and extremely strong. Hmm, muscular giant spiders? Could be worse, I guess. The good news is that this is all unconfirmed information. If we're very lucky, and gravity there turns out to be just a bit stronger than Earth's, then, of course, it'll be much easier to live there. The next thing we know about Kepler-22b is that it's about 15% closer to its star than we are to the Sun. If Kepler-22b existed in our solar system, it would be located somewhere between Earth and Venus. Does that mean we're all going to burn? No, silly. As I mentioned before, the star Kepler-22 is pretty cold, just some 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's why we can assume that the temperatures on Kepler-22b will be about the same as we have on Earth. If the planet orbits its star the same way Earth orbits the Sun, which we don't actually know, Kepler-22b can rotate around its star on its side, like, for example, Uranus. What? Didn't you know Uranus is actually lying on its side? Also, look at its rings. Yes, Uranus also has rings, like Saturn, but they're vertical. The universe is truly a mysterious place. So, if Kepler-22b is really something like that, then the weather on the planet will be, to put it mildly, not very good. Incredibly cold winters will be regularly followed by hot summers. And, just like with tidally locked planets, we'd be able to live more or less comfortably only on the narrow piece of land between these two crazy sides. Let's hope that this is not the case and the planet rotates normally. But it's not all that bad. Studies show that there may be an ocean on Kepler-22b. You already know that water means life, but in this case, it's also a big plus because a planet covered by an ocean always has more stable temperatures. The water absorbs some of the heat and distributes it evenly across the planet. The hot parts cool down and the icy ones warm up. By the way, that's exactly what happened to Earth billions of years ago. When our planet started getting its first little puddles, our beloved moon helped these puddles to spread all over the planet. Thanks to this, a burning horror that used to be our Earth turned into a cute little ball full of life. So if Kepler-22b has water but no atmosphere, scientists think that the average temperature there could be around 12 degrees Fahrenheit. But if there's also an Earth-like atmosphere, then the temperature can reach 72 degrees Fahrenheit. That would be nice. And finally, one year there is equal to 290 Earth days, about nine months. The planet has no natural satellites, so unfortunately, we'd have to say goodbye to a beautiful view of the moon. On the bright side, we'd probably be able to see the sun as a distant little star. We could admire it in the night sky, remembering our home while not hiding from giant spiders. And this is all that we know at the moment. Unfortunately, it's quite difficult to explore such planets, so there's a lot of very important data that we don't know. For example, what kind of planet is this anyway? Yep, we're missing the most important information about Kepler-22b. We don't know if it's a rocky planet or not. And if not, then all the previously mentioned information means nothing. It may turn out to be a gas planet, or a planet covered with gas but with a solid core, like Neptune, or a water world covered with a giant ocean. In this case, it better be a water planet. Then at least we could build some kind of underwater city there. We could filter the water and eat fish until we evolve into an amphibious species. Does it even count as evolution if we go back to our roots? Scientists, however, think that Kepler-22b may turn out to be a Neptune-like planet. Some astronomers have even assigned the planet to a category of mini-Neptunes. Yes, this is a real planetary category. But this hasn't been proven yet. But even if, fortunately for us, Kepler-22b turns out to be a rocky planet, we still don't know what the atmosphere is like there. Does it exist at all? What if it turns out to be something like the atmosphere of Venus? 
which is more toxic than your ex. Then we'd have to dig deep underground to somehow survive on this planet. And then we'd have to come up with a heat source, because it's pretty cold underground. Yeah, let's hope this won't be the case. There are many possibilities with Kepler-22b. So far, we don't have a clear answer. But let's hope that scientists will find it before we load the first people into shuttles and send them to conquer Kepler-22b. That would be awkward if it turns out to be a gas planet or something like that. We're traveling through space at the speed of light. The route from Earth to the Sun at that speed will take only 8 minutes. But it would take us about 35 years to reach our destination, which is, by the way, still very fast. By comparison, a conventional rocket would take about 600,000 years to make the journey. And here we are. It's a star system suspiciously very similar to our own. And our scientists suspect that life could exist here, just like on Earth. A red dwarf, 30% the size and weight of the sun, lies at the heart of this star system. But these are the planets orbiting the star that interest us most. The first of these is L9859b. Its size is somewhere between Earth and Mars, but it's very light. It's only half the mass of Venus. But life is impossible on this rocky planet. It's too close to the star, and it's so hot, you'd burn a cake if you tried baking it on its surface. It's about 100 degrees higher than the maximum of your oven. The planet makes a complete circle around its host star in just two days, compared to 365 for Earth. And it gets 22 times more energy than we get from the sun. So it's not only hot there, but there's a lot of dangerous radiation. The next planet is 2.8 million miles from its host star. That's 13 times closer than the distance from Mercury to the sun. And it makes a complete revolution around the star in 3.7 days. But what's interesting is that the planet is 30% bigger than the Earth and twice as heavy. So it belongs to the class of super-Earth planets. Such planets can be rich in water ice, methane, and hydrogen. These are some of the elements that are necessary for life's existence. Many scientists believe that it's on such planets that extraterrestrial civilizations can live. But because of the great weight of the planet, it has a strong gravitational force. So these civilizations may not be able to fly into space because it's harder for them to get out of the gravitational trap of a super-Earth planet. However, life isn't possible here because the planet is still too close to the host star. And just like in our solar system, the two nearest planets are too hot. But the third planet looks more promising. L9859d. It's almost twice as heavy as the Earth and 50% bigger. Scientists have calculated that about a third of its mass could be water. For comparison, the mass of all water on Earth is only 0.02%. The presence of water is the main condition for the emergence of life. But we can only guess where the water might be. It could be on the surface, but high temperatures can turn large oceans into giant clouds of steam. But water can also be contained in the groundwater below the surface. Well, we can't know that for sure yet. Let's move on to the next planet in the star system. This newly discovered planet is of the Super Venus class, L9859e. It's a rocky planet three times the size of Earth. The Super Venus class means that the planet is heavy enough to have an atmosphere, but the conditions there are more like a greenhouse. Different gases fill the atmosphere there. Star rays pass through them to the planet's surface, reflect off it, and rise upward but the dense gases don't let them leave the atmosphere, so the planet gets hotter and hotter. This is the greenhouse effect that we try so hard to avoid on Earth. On top of that, the stellar wind carries water vapor and other elements from the upper layers of the atmosphere into outer space. Life cannot exist on such a planet, nor could it ever originate, just like on Earth's twin sister, Venus. So far, all the planets we've looked at are outside the habitable zone of the host star. That's the sweet spot at a perfect distance from the star. Not too close so that the planet isn't too hot and the water there doesn't evaporate instantly. And not too far away so that the planet doesn't look like a cold desert. And planets B, C, D, and E are too close to the host star. But there's another hypothetical planet F in this star system located right in this sweet spot. 
This super Earth candidate is 2.5 times heavier than our home planet. So we have hopes that it's a rocky world, just like the other planets in this star system. The weight of planet F is enough to have a dense atmosphere, and the temperature on its surface should be suitable for water to exist there in liquid form. The planet makes a complete circle around its host star in 23 days, which literally means it's New Year every three weeks. It isn't very likely, though, that there's a civilization there that celebrates it. Indeed, the very existence of this planet is very doubtful, because we still have no direct evidence. All the other planets have been discovered by the transit method. That's when we point our telescopes directly at a star and watch its brightness change. When there's a slight drop in the star's brightness, that's when a planet has passed between us and the star, like this dot. We have a short period of time while the planet is in the background of the star to determine its size and speed. Sometimes we can observe such transits of Mercury and Venus on the solar disk. And there are at least 29 potentially habitable planets out there in distant space that can observe Earth in the same way. About 1,715 stars within a few hundred light years are perfectly located for it. Each star has planets around it, but only 29 of them are in the habitable zone. So there really could be life and an intelligent extraterrestrial civilization out there. If so, they could point their telescopes toward the sun and see a small dot pass across the solar disk. And they could have been making these observations for at least the last 5,000 years. So they could see how our civilization was born and how we evolved. Moreover, these planets are close enough to pick up our radio signals and even television broadcasts. But it works both ways. Radio signals travel through space at the speed of light. We mastered this technology about 100 years ago. So if there really is a civilization out there somewhere, we would pick up their signals too. But so far, it hasn't happened. So we have no proof of the existence of life on these planets. The discovery of a star system like L9859 is very important to us because we're always looking for life outside of our solar system. And super Earth-class planets are even better suited for the origin of life than planet Earth itself. Such planets are sometimes called superhabitable. So some scientists think that Earth is a good place for life, but not the best. Superhabitable planets would have to be 30% larger than Earth and twice as heavy. This would create stronger gravity, which would make the atmosphere on the planet denser and with a higher concentration of oxygen. This in turn would raise the average temperature on the planet to a perfect 77 degrees Fahrenheit, so plants would thrive there. Also, stronger gravity makes the surface of the planet flatter, so there might be more oceans there than on Earth. This would make aquatic life much more diverse. The host star also plays a very important role. It should be smaller than the sun. The bigger the star, the more of its fuel it burns. This means that the lifespan of such stars is much shorter. For example, the lifespan of the sun is about 10 billion years, but a red dwarf can live up to 30 billion years. More time, more opportunity for the birth of life and evolution. So far, scientists have discovered 24 superabundant planets, but that still doesn't mean that there is life there for real. But some scientists believe that there are already at least 36 advanced civilizations in our galaxy, besides Earth. They've searched for similar worlds on the star map. First, we find stars that look like the Sun, among about 100 billion stars throughout the galaxy. Now we choose from them those that are rich in iron. Such stars burn at the perfect temperature and help the planets around them gain an iron core and become Earth-like. Now let's pick relatively young stars from this pile, because when they get older, they expand and either absorb the planets around them or burn them up. One last thing, let's find planets in this pile that are in the habitable zone of the star. And voila, 36 worlds may be inhabited by some unknown civilization. But we won't know for sure until we get in touch with them. The ground shakes and you hear a loud cracking sound. Oh no, the dome is failing. Everyone runs to their escape pods to evacuate. People are pushing and shoving. The Earth-like atmosphere in the dome is going to be compromised and you'll be exposed to the thin elements on the surface of Mars. Everyone rushes to put their helmets on. 
The crack is getting bigger by the second, and people are panicking, trying to get on the escape shuttles as quickly as possible. In the chaos, they all jam into the wrong ships, and there isn't any room for you. Red warning lights begin to flash in the dome, and a voice rings out, telling everyone to put their helmets on. The Martian atmosphere is only minutes away from rushing in, and humans won't be able to breathe otherwise. This is just your luck. You only just arrived on Mars. As the ships zoom off into the distance, you wonder what you should do. You call out for help, but no one answers. Suddenly, a robot guide rolls up behind you, and you hear a faint noise coming from its speakers. It says, no one can hear you because the atmosphere on Mars is so much less dense than on Earth. It also has a lot of carbon dioxide, which absorbs sound waves. Even if a loud concert was happening just 30 feet away, it would sound like it was miles away. Would you like me to assist you with anything? You ask it for help, and it shows you a 3D layout of the entire dome. You can see a few other shuttle stations, so you decide to aim for them. Unfortunately, you're going to need to get to the opposite side of the dome to reach another shuttle station. Just as you begin to panic and wonder how you could get there, the robot transforms into a bike and tells you to hop on. You get in and cruise through the city, looking at all the empty buildings and streets. The crack is getting even bigger, and tiny pieces of the dome begin to fall from above, like snow. When you arrive at the other station, the last few people are boarding the only shuttle. You chase after them, desperately trying to get their attention. As you ding the bell on your bike, though, it barely makes any noise at all. Their ship pulls away before they can notice you. You ask why sounds aren't working, and the robot explains that you can barely hear high-pitched noises on Mars. The carbon dioxide makes high-pitched noises, like bells and chirping birds, almost impossible to hear. If only you were still on Earth, they might have noticed you. The robot tells you that there's one last chance to escape. He transforms into a tiny spaceship. You get in, and he flies through the crack in the dome out into space. It's going so fast that you should be back on Earth before long. Just as you're starting to relax and enjoy the sights of space, you see a red light flashing on the robot. You ask it what's wrong, but you get no response. Suddenly, you realize that you can't hear anything in space. Sound travels in waves, and it needs something to move through, like air or water. Space is a vacuum with no air, so you can't hear any sounds at all. The spaceship suddenly changes direction and blasts off away from Earth. You try to steer the robot in the right direction, but you can't figure out how to get its attention. The ship charts a flight all the way to Venus. As you get closer, the turbulence kicks in. Venus has winds faster than any tornado on Earth. You keep getting swept away, trying to find a safe space to land in. The robot manages to keep a steady course, despite the wind throwing it all over the place. You can already feel the heat through all the layers. Finally, the robot spots a small cave in the distance and attempts to land there. As soon as the robot touches ground, it morphs into a spacesuit you can wear, so you're safe in the extreme environment. Today's forecast in Venus? Heat. Extremely boiling temperatures all day and night. Expect clouds of sulfuric acid and gale force winds. The atmosphere is mainly made up of carbon dioxide, so you can expect your voice to drop deeper too because of the planet's dense atmosphere. It's only the second planet closest to the sun, but it's actually the hottest. Its atmosphere traps the heat from the sun and keeps it around the planet. It's actually so hot on Venus that it could melt lead. If you were cruising by with the spaceship, the whole thing would melt in a matter of minutes. Luckily, you have this indestructible robot armor. You try to ask the robot how to get back, and your voice sounds crazy. Your vocal cords vibrate slower here than on Earth, which makes the pitch lower. But at the same time, the speed of sound on Venus is a lot faster, making it more squeaky. Then, the high carbon dioxide content in the air creates a weird effect that tricks your brain into thinking that the sound source is small. Overall, you sound something like a cartoon duck. You look out across the horizon and see many hills and mountains scattered across the plain. But the robot tells you that many of these are volcanoes. Venus actually has more volcanoes than any other planet in the solar system. Scientists discover more than 1,600 only on the surface, which could mean there are even more than that still undiscovered. Yeah, maybe being here all day isn't such a good idea. And not just because of the heat. A single day on Venus lasts 243 Earth days. In fact, a day on Venus is longer than a year, 
because it only takes 225 days for it to complete a rotation around the sun. It's hard to understand each other, but you eventually manage. The robot tells you that it just got lost, and that you'll be back on Earth in no time. While walking around the cave, you realize that you're actually inside a volcano. You tell the robot to hurry up and get you back home before it erupts. It's clearly not very good at navigating space, though, because it's not long before you end up somewhere else. You're now on Titan, Saturn's largest moon. The moon is so large that it's even bigger than Mercury, the planet closest to the sun. The spaceship arrives in the atmosphere, which feels and behaves similar to Earth's. The only noticeable difference is the orangey haze hanging in the air, which makes it a lot more difficult to see. As you descend towards the moon, the robot detects signs of cyanide gas all over the surface and fluffy clouds made out of iced methane. You land on a soft spot and set about trying to get the robot to take you back to the right place. At least this time, you're not sweating. The robot transforms again and begins to scan the surroundings. The atmosphere is around 60% thicker than on Earth. Walking around feels like you're wading through maple syrup. There is a really high nitrogen content in the air, so things sound surprisingly similar to how they do on Earth. You tell the robot you really want to get home now, but it comes out as a loud, raspy shout. This is because Titan has more nitrogen than Earth, and because sound travels a bit slower. Luckily, you can still understand each other here. The robot tells you that it needs to absorb a bit more energy from its solar panels before taking off. So you have a look around. This moon is one of the only things in the solar system that has fixed bodies of liquid like rivers, lakes, and seas on its surface. You can understand why the robot got lost now, given how similar Titan is to Earth. Titan even has liquid cycles, with rain, evaporation, and condensation. This isn't water, like back on Earth, though. The main liquid here is methane. Scientists think that there may be volcanic activity, but instead of molten hot lava spewing out, it's water. Other planets, like Mars, have ice on the peaks of their mountains and evidence of water beneath the surface. But nothing is as close to Earth as Titan. Some scientists believe that this moon could be our next home billions of years from now. The sun's temperature will increase by then, making the Earth's atmosphere uninhabitable. By then, Titan's cool temperatures will be good enough to create stable oceans and sustain life. The robot finally gathers enough electricity to fly away, so you can head home. It'll be nice to have a normal conversation where your voice doesn't sound like an exaggerated cartoon. Whew. Today, we're going to work our core, so get ready to sweat! Oops, sorry, wrong core. Hey, we've traveled far and wide, down to the Earth's inner core and up into outer space. But what if we could combine these adventures and find out what hides in the innards of other planets and moons in the solar system? With the help of this interstellar hyperdrill, we can achieve that, at least in part. Coordinates are in, all systems ready, and our first destination is… the moon. Our moon, in fact. We land on its gray and desolate surface under the black sky. No blue here, because there's very little atmosphere to disperse the light. The drill starts working, and we first go through the outer layer of the moon, the crust, just like on Earth. We're on the sunny side, so the thickness of this layer is only 43 miles. But were we to land on the dark side, it would be more than twice as thick. The moon is a rocky body, so its crust is largely made of silicon, iron, aluminum, calcium, oxygen, and magnesium, with much smaller amounts of other elements. Further down, we find the mantle, and it's a long and tenuous journey through. This layer is about 850 miles thick. It gets hotter as we go deeper, finding composite minerals, pyroxene and olivine. They're made of iron, silicon, oxygen, and magnesium in different proportions. Finally, we break through the hard layers and into the semi-molten outer core. Another journey of about 93 miles ahead through this scalding swamp. And we dive into the iron ocean of the liquid core shell. It's nearly 60 miles thick, and the molten metal threatens to evaporate us. But this drill was made to sustain an extremely heavy onslaught. And that's how we finally come to a sudden halt. In the deepest reaches of the moon, there's a solid iron core which is 150 miles thick. We could drill through it, but it would be unnecessary, 
So we just set the flag here and skip to the next planet on our drilling list. And it's Mercury! It was hot deep inside the moon, but on the surface of the smallest planet in the system, it's even hotter. That's because it's so close to the sun, of course. Alright, let's drill. Mercury has a pretty thick outer shell, which is both crust and mantle, going about 250 miles deep. Not the most fascinating journey, it's not unlike the Earth in many respects. But then, the drill stops, ramming into a solid metal wall. It's Mercury's core, which has a diameter of over 2,500 miles. It takes up to 85% of the planet's overall diameter. No use trying to drill through this one. It's fully metal and extremely dense. Skipping to the next planet, and we're on Mars now. Oh look, it's sunset here, and the sun is making the sky hazy blue. But you know the drill. I mean, we're here to drill. So that's what we do. Mars' crust is quite thin compared to Earth's, just 6 to 30 miles deep. Its composition is much the same, though. Iron, aluminum, calcium, potassium, and magnesium. That's one of the reasons why humans are looking to colonize the red planet one day. It's very similar to our own. We're very quick to drill through the first layer, and the second one, the mantle, is now upon us. It's a hard and rocky layer about 1,100 miles thick. Thanks to its size, Mars isn't seismically active any longer. There's simply no magma boiling close underneath the surface of the planet, making it silent and docile. It's a long dig, but we finally come to a screeching halt, bumping into the core. A ball of iron, nickel, and sulfur with a diameter of 2,000 to 2,600 miles. This core is bigger than that of Mercury, but the planet itself is larger too, so it figures. Okay then, our next stop is even more interesting, because it's… Jupiter. This gas giant has a mass twice that of all the other planets in the solar system combined. And we landed right in the middle of an ocean. The ocean, I dare say, it's the largest one in the whole system, and it's made of liquid hydrogen. The drill goes smoothly through the surface of the planet, because there's no rock or hard metal here, only gas and liquid. But the shaking, yikes! The pressure on this planet is more than just huge, it's unimaginable. The drill is barely able to withstand it, and as it's going deeper, the pressure's becoming higher too. We've reached Jupiter's core, and it's nearly too much to bear. The temperature here is about 90,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and the core itself is not solid but liquid as well, kept together by the immense pressure from all sides. The drill starts to rattle. Bad sign. Let's get out of here before it breaks. Whew! No winds, no pressure, no heat. All around us is a vast, icy wasteland, crisscrossed by ridges and reddish bands. It's Europa, one of Jupiter's most promising moons. As we drill through the ice, let me explain. Europa is one of the candidates to have extraterrestrial life in the solar system and it can be found right beneath the icy shell through which we're now digging. It's only 10 to 15 miles thick, while down below is an enormous saltwater ocean, twice bigger than all of Earth's oceans combined. The deepest point on Earth is Challenger Deep, and it's a bit over 6 miles down. The ocean on Europa, on the other hand, can be up to 100 miles deep. Who knows what can be lurking in that deep, dark sea? Anyway, we travel fast through the water and finally reach the bottom of the ocean. The mantle starts here, and it's made of rock, just like on Earth. And not much deeper in, we find the metal core of the moon. Europa is a little smaller than Earth's moon, so it's no surprise we reach its center pretty fast. Okay, skip drive on, let's go further. Oh, I'd rather we drill in as fast as we can. Just look around, it's blazing here. We're definitely on Io, another moon of Jupiter, and the most volcanically active world in the solar system. Look, that volcano is twice the size of Everest, and it's erupting right now. Thankfully, we're under Io's surface already, but that's not to say we're safe. It's all molten down here too, mostly yellow and brownish hue, due to the huge amounts of sulfur. The stench must be horrible. Anyway, the most peculiar feature is that both inside and outside, everything's always on the move on Io. Jupiter and its other moons create tremendous tidal forces, making the surface of Io swell over 300 feet up and down. Like the largest tsunamis on Earth, only here it's not water but rock. The deeper we go, the calmer it gets, though. 
until we're finally at the iron core. It's still hot here, but at least there's no shaking and swelling like above. Let's put up another flag and go to the next point. And that would be Saturn! The second largest planet of the solar system, and the one best known for its spectacular rings. Not the only one to have them at all, mind you, but we'll get to it. Now, as you've surely noticed, our drill is simply falling down through the gaseous hydrogen and helium, making up most of the planet's surface and atmosphere. No need to work here. Just wait and hope the immense pressure won't crush our drill to a hunk of junk. At last, the pressures become so enormous that we find ourselves in the liquid hydrogen. And here, we start diving. Soon, we'll reach the solid core of Saturn. Ah, here we are. It's made of iron and nickel and is actually quite small compared to the rest of the planet. Well, the last destination awaits, so come on! And here we come. Neptune. The drill immediately deploys anchors, because the winds here are extremely powerful. They reach speeds five times greater than the most devastating hurricanes on Earth. Neptune is covered in a pretty thin layer of hydrogen and helium, just like Saturn or Jupiter. But underneath, there's much more than that. It's hot, windy, and lonely here on the outskirts of the solar system. So let's dig already. Beneath the gases, there's suddenly a bubbling hot mass of water, methane, and ammonia. Pew! These substances are hot, despite Neptune being called an ice giant. The name comes from its core. Deep inside, where we're quickly headed right now, a small ball of rock and ice sits all alone. And despite the boiling temperatures above, the ice beneath is ever cold. When you explode planets, things get red hot. Atmospheres are stripped away. Stuff is flying apart. Everything collapses. The world becomes brighter than a dozen suns. You squeeze your eyes shut and cover your ears. Your hair stands on end. The sheer power of a cosmic blast is terrifying. Some time before the explosion, you're hovering in almost complete darkness. Below, you see the moon. Or what you think looks like the moon. The surface of this light-colored sphere is pockmarked with craters left by meteorites. You see huge, steep hills stretching for miles. It's Mercury. And right now, you're going to explode it. As if in slow-mo, you watch the planet fall apart. And then, in the blink of an eye, you see a wall of debris closing in on you. First, giant chunks of rock. Those are all that's left of the planet's solid crust and rocky mantle. The appearance and structure of the debris flying in your direction changes. Now, the stuff looks liquid, like splashes of quicksilver. That's Mercury's metallic core bursting apart. It used to take up 85% of the planet's volume. And finally, it's a firework of solid pieces again. It's the planet's solid core. The explosion is so powerful it knocks Earth into a different orbit. The sun hiccups and swallows down an enormous cloud of dust. That's everything Mercury has left behind. But don't worry, our solar system won't lose any planets. This whole explosion thing is only a temporary experiment. Once you're done watching the show, you press another button, and the planet gets back together, as if you've hit rewind. You approach the next planet on your way. Its surface is hiding under a super-dense atmosphere made up of carbon dioxide. If you decided to land on Venus, you'd watch thick clouds of sulfuric acid pass by. You'd see the planet's surface, reddish-brown, dry, and incredibly hot. You'd probably walk across flat, smooth plains, covering two-thirds of the planet's surface. You'd gawk at volcanoes littering Venus, all 1,600 of them. Unfortunately, you won't be able to do that because you press the button. Boom! Huge chunks of basalt fly away from the center of the explosion. That used to be the planet's 12-mile thick crust. Then you spot bright burning meteors flying towards you at incredible speed. Those are chunks of Venus's molten rocky mantle. The fire rain seems endless, maybe because the mantle was 1,200 miles thick. But that's not the most massive part of the planet. The power of the explosion forces apart Venus's metallic iron core. 
This core used to be twice as wide as the mantle. You reach the blue marble of your home planet. What will its insides look like, scattered in space? From above, Earth looks pretty. 71% of its surface is blue, because of all that water, seas and oceans. There are also areas of green, yellow, and brown and white swirls. You press the button. The planet bursts apart in a hailstorm of rocks. They're what's left from Earth's thin crust and much, much thicker mantle. It used to take up nearly 84% of the entire planet's volume. You see the rocky rain change into something way more liquid. It's scorching hot iron and nickel that used to make up Earth's outer core. The metals weren't under enough pressure to be solid. The bang is so powerful that it takes apart Earth's inner core. It used to be a solid ball of iron and nickel. After the pieces fly apart, they follow their own orbits around the sun. The most massive chunks crash into the moon, and some travel further and get swallowed by our star. You can't linger. The red planet is waiting for you. The surface of Mars is covered with rusty colored dust. The thickness of the dust layer varies from area to area, but in most places, it's seven feet thick. The ground is colored gold, brown, tan, and even greenish. The hue depends on the minerals that make up the soil. The planet's surface is rocky. It's covered with dry lake beds, craters, volcanoes, and canyons. Bang! Mars is a rocky planet. You have to dodge mountain-sized chunks of crust made up of volcanic basalt rock. What you see next looks as if you've blown up huge amounts of soft, rocky toothpaste. That used to be Mars's mantle, composed of oxygen, silicates, and other minerals. And then, the flying pieces get solid again. Ah, it's the planet's core's turn. It was solid, made mostly of iron, nickel, and sulfur. Billions and trillions of fragments of all sizes, from a small moon to pieces several feet wide, get launched in all directions. But only very few parts have enough momentum to leave the solar system. The whole event slightly changes Earth's orbit, and the temperature on our planet goes up by 18 degrees Fahrenheit. You leave rocky planets behind and close in on the first gas giant on your way. It's Jupiter. Thick brown, yellow, red, and white clouds hide its surface. They make the planet look colorful and beautifully striped. You hit the button. This time, the view is different. Instead of chunks of solid crust, you see jet streams of gas accelerating from the planet's center. It's what used to be Jupiter's atmosphere, made up of hydrogen and helium gas. In no time, the matter hurtling away to space turns liquid. That's hydrogen changing its form under immense atmospheric pressure closer to the center of the planet. A bit later, the liquid is already a mixture of metallic hydrogen and helium. And finally, something solid. It was probably Jupiter's core, 14 to 18 times the mass of Earth. The gas giant's diameter was about 90,000 miles, but the blast lasts no more than half a second. The explosion of Jupiter is so strong, it evaporates smaller planets like Mars and Earth. The sun remains pretty much untouched. It gets hotter and kind of unstable for a bit, but it doesn't last long. The next gas giant on your way is Saturn. At first sight, it looks as if the planet has a surface. The seemingly solid yellowish-brown sphere is surrounded by layers of clouds. Saturn's trademark rings are awesome and colorful, gray, beige, and tan. They're actually groups of tiny ringlets that are made up of floating chunks of water, ice, rocks, and dust. These chunks range in size from specks to massive skyscraper-sized pieces. While orbiting Saturn, they keep colliding and larger pieces get shattered. You're surprised to see that the rings aren't perfectly round. They have bends caused by the gravitational pull from the nearby moons. 53 of them are confirmed. Titan, an icy world bigger than our moon and even Mercury, is the largest. What you see looks eerily similar to what happened when you exploded Jupiter. There's only one difference. Saturn's rings break apart sending rocks and ice flying into space at incredible speed. 
the largest pieces crash with the planet's moons, wiping away the smallest of them. You see streams of gas, mostly hydrogen and helium, with a bit of methane, ammonia, and water. They're moving at breakneck speed away from where the center of the planet used to be. After that, splashes of liquid matter, that's liquid hydrogen, that later turns metallic. And finally, the chunks of the solid core made up of rocky materials. You're looking at a beautiful blue-green sphere of the ice giant Uranus. The planet gets this unusual hue when the light from the sun gets reflected off the planet's surface. Plus, Uranus's atmosphere is mostly hydrogen and helium, with traces of methane gas that absorb the red light. Anyway, bang! This time, it's massive blobs of ice that are hurtling in your direction first. They used to be the part of the planet's ice mantle that once made up 80% of the planet's volume. But why does this ice look liquid? On Uranus, frozen liquid isn't solid like on Earth. Ice is a hot, dense fluid made up of water, ammonia ice, and methane. It's often called the Water Ammonia Ocean. After the bizarre ice rain, you see solid pieces of the planet's rocky core. It used to be small, no more than half the Earth's mass. Some of Uranus's moons get pulverized in the explosion, and several even get ejected out of the solar system. The explosion also slightly shifts Neptune's orbit. And the last planet on your way, Neptune. It looks blue because of a layer of swirling gas and permanent clouds. No time to linger. Boom! The planet doesn't have a solid surface. That's why, after pressing the button, you see Neptune's liquid mantle bursting. It looks like a water-filled balloon thrown down from the 50th floor. This sends splashes of water, ammonia, and methane ices away into space. It's followed by lava-like remains of the planet's mantle. It used to be liquid, red-hot, and rich in methane, ammonia, and water. That's what's left from Neptune's solid core, made up of iron and other metals. 